eighth chapter, and uh, we'll go into the ninth chapter a little bit as we go along. But you and I know that every day in this life we have to make decisions. We're faced with decisions every day that we live. Some of these are major decisions, some of them are sort of insignificant decisions. But every decision that we make in this life carries with it consequences. Now these can be good consequences or they can be negative consequences. And I think we have all can look back over our lives and we can consider decisions that we've made and how many times have you said, well, I wish I could do this over. Or I wish I hadn't have been so stupid. Or I wish... You know, I would have given this more thought, or I wish I would have even prayed more about it. You know, we we all face decisions in this life, and um, as Frank was talking uh, earlier, one of the most important decisions that we'll ever make in this life is the decision to accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, and that is the most important decision that we'll ever make in this life that carries with it not only big consequences, but eternal consequences. And the decision you make is going to determine where you spend eternity. But not only that, but it's going to also determine the impact that other people can have on your life and the impact that you can have on other people's lives as we live this life. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Now, what I'd like for you to do, I'd like for someone, anyone, just to volunteer to stand up and give me, give us a testimony of the time you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior. Anybody? Go ahead. Um, you can stand up, sit down. You, you do whatever you want. Well, this is um, when uh, my grandmother, my great grandmother, passed away. Um, it was on July um, 20th. Um, she was in Saginaw, Michigan. I was in Chicago, and my youngest son was turning a year. We had planned a birthday party for him, and she called everybody to Michigan because she wanted to see everybody. And it was too late for me to cancel the party, so I said, "Okay, I'm gonna have a party." And as soon as we get through having the party, we'll head there. So I did. And when I got there, my great grandmother said, "I was waiting for you." And I said, "Oh." And I somehow I knew she didn't mean and literally waiting for you to get here. Where have you been? It was just like she decided to hang in there until I got there. And so when I got there, um, my mother, aunts and stuff had been sitting with her at the hospital and they all decided to go freshen up and you know, go home for a while. And I, I had nine girl cousins plus my sister. We were all there with her. And then my great grandmother said, someone opened the door and the, the room to her her um, the door to her hospital room was ajar. It wasn't closed, but it wasn't open. And she said, someone opened the door. And we, uh, my cousin Denise walked and pushed the door to the wall. And then my grandmother passed away. And we all decided that we saw her walk into heaven. And I decided that day that I wanted to do the same. So I'm sorry, that's me crying. It happened over 28 years ago. Um, I accepted Jesus right there because I wanted to walk into heaven like I witnessed my grandmother do. And it was it was awesome. And she was 103 years old. Wow. And all, wow, God bless her. All her wrinkles went away and her hair was plaited and her hair was shiny and but before that she looked in such a mess. But when she passed away, the brightness came over her, and all her flaws were away, and all her hair was shiny and bright, and it was just beautiful. You know, I hear this testimony, and I think about, um, I don't know if y'all um, watch In Touch at, uh, at home, but I was thinking about um, Dr. Stanley's 
message as you were speaking uh, just just then last night about encouraging ourselves and the life that we live the impact that we have is writing history and the impact that your great grandmother had on you even though it may have just been a short story right there in that moment it impacted you for the rest of your life and the legacy that she left being a godly lady and being able to make that transition from this life into eternity <clears throat> in a peaceful way is certainly a testimony. Anybody else got anything they might share? All right, let me ask you a question. How can someone who is not a Christian, remember we're talking about decisions, right? How can someone who is not a Christian distinguish between godly wisdom and foolishness or folly. They can't. They can't? Okay. Uh, if, you'll, if you'll go to uh, the first verse of chapter 8, and I'd like for someone to read the verses 1 through 6. Anybody? Anybody. Listen as wisdom calls out, hear and as understanding raises her voice. On the hilltop along the road, she takes her stand at the crossroads. By the gates at the entrance to the town, on the road leading in, she cries aloud, I call to you, to all of you. I raise my voice to all people. You simple people use good judgment. You foolish people show some understanding. Listen to me, for I have important things to tell you. Everything I say is right. Everything I say is right. This, according to Solomon, is Lady Wisdom. Crying out from where? From three places right here. She's crying out from the heights that overlook a busy road. She's crying out from a crossroads. And if you think about a crossroads, a crossroad is a point either physically or in this life where we have to make a decision. We have to decide which way we're going to go. And then the third place is at the gates of the city. So Lady Wisdom is calling out right here to people who can hear and to everybody that will hear. And so here's the thing. What's the difference between Lady Wisdom calling out and for Folly, who we're going to talk about in chapter 9, calling out. What is Folly? What is foolishness? Yes. Our own thinking. Our own thinking? Where do we derive our own thinking, our mindset? I mean, if it's not Christ's thinking, if we're not thinking Christ-like. Okay. Not thinking Christ-like. So, the invitation to folly, to foolishness, sort of paints an appealing picture. It's very appealing. But the short-term consequences is pleasure. It may be riches. It may be uh, promotions. It may be anything in this life that seems very, very appealing to, to all of us. But the long-term consequences of giving in to folly is death. Okay? Now, on the other hand, the invitation of wisdom given right here in verses 1 through 6 right here uh, emphasizes the importance of making correct moral choices. And these correct moral choices, when it says... I'll tell you what is right in, in, in verse 6 right here. And from the opening of my lips will come right things. So, so the moral choices that we make when we listen to Lady Wisdom right here includes godly guidance. Godly guidance on, on, on how to make these choices. And so... The long-term benefit of choosing wisdom over foolishness is eternal life with Jesus Christ. And so 
With that in mind, I think about Paul, not the apostle, uh, Pastor Paul, as he drives down to help his brother after going through chemotherapy. He went through 12 hours of chemo, straight chemotherapy from like 2 p.m. to 2 a.m. And, and you know, when, when we talk about that, and I, we talked to Jim, I talked to Jim just before class, and, and when he was diagnosed with cancer, he was in stage four. And that's the step right before death. I mean, that's it right there. And so when we think about decisions that we make in this life, I think we need to think about the eternal consequences that not only those decisions are going to have for us in our life, but it's also going to be the decisions and the consequences that it's going to have in other people's lives. So like when your great-grandmother shared with you and as she passed into eternity right there, you knew that you wanted to spend that eternity with your grandmother, but now as a more mature Christian, you know that the life that you live and the decision that you made and the answering wisdom rather than folly brings you the abundant life of this life as well as the eternal security of spending that eternity with Jesus. And so, so that's the thing. Now in Proverbs 8, 1 through 6 right here, how would you, how would you summarize the <clears throat> advice of Lady Wisdom, the gracious Lady Wisdom that's described right here. How would you summarize, if you look at verses 1 through 6, paraphrase that for me. How would you summarize it? Lady Wisdom provides life and abundance and fulfillment that brings um, righteousness and true wealth versus natural substances and things in the that are full of pride and deceit in the Okay. She's, uh, she's everywhere. Wisdom is everywhere. You just got to be able to see it and recognize it for what it is. So how does God make his wisdom known to people today? Through the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Okay. Right. Go ahead. His word, the word, people's situations. So, yes. I just want to clarify that he constantly keeps on, um, once the Holy Spirit is activated inside of you, he's constantly uh, directing you to go the right way. So that's how she keeps on calling out because she's keep on telling you which way to go. And the wisdom that you have had and you have learned, you should know by now not to lean on your own thinking. So she's telling you which way to go, and the Holy Spirit keeps on calling out and saddening you which way to go. So how does God make his wisdom known to non-believers? Yes. By the preaching of the gospel. By the great commission going into all the world and preaching the gospel. Preaching of the gospel, hearing the word. Right. Right. Huh? I'm sorry, the word is truth and it brings wisdom. Okay, All right. the word is truth and it brings wisdom. God shows you the path that you should go and it's up to you. He gives us free will to make that choice. All right, God shows us the path, but how does he, how does a non-believer come to the point to where he accepts God's path or God's chosen way? I think, I think, um, I don't know if it's if you would call him a non-believer, but I know that how I'm finding my way back is because of the circumstances I put myself in by the decisions I made that were not Christ-like. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, I didn't have somebody come and tell me that you have to come back to the church. I knew that all along I've always been invited by God, but because I wasn't raised with a Christian attitude, okay, I knew that for my life not to be um, 
stressful to me that I had to make the choice that I had to have Christ in my life again. I mean, that's how I look at it. I, I think that's good because you're talking about your, you know, God is bringing to your remembrance places that you've been because of unwise decisions that you may have made earlier. Yeah, I just earlier. disagreed with you about the part when you say non-believer. I think a, a non-believer is a person who is um, an atheist that doesn't believe in Christ at all, does not believe, I mean, nothing. Uh, to me, that's how a non-believer is. I said unbeliever. Okay, unbeliever, yeah. but. Well, see, the difference is this right here. Either you believe in Jesus Christ and you accept him as your personal savior or you're an un, or, or a non-believer or unbeliever. You know, a lot of times we use the expression believer as Christians, those who have okay. been saved by grace. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And so I guess, you know, we could use a better choice of words. Uh, <coughs> even though, here, here's the thing. Christ, Christ here, here, explained it thing. as a lost you, sheep. If, here, here's the thing right here is that when I when I refer to unbelievers there's a difference in believing there is a God and believing in God yeah. there's a difference in yeah. believing there is a God and placing your complete faith and trust in him yeah. so that would be an unbelief okay in terms of yeah go ahead I mean scripture talks about the word of the God's law being written on our hearts so we already know it's there. And then being saying that they're atheists or anything else, I disagree with that because even the atheists, they deep down inside know the truth, but they deny the truth. That's what Romans 1, and that's what Paul goes through in that whole okay. beginning okay, of that. Okay, I understand, that, yeah. And okay. that the yeah. understanding. But usually it's, God has put this inside of us, this law that's on our hearts, this thing that draws us close in which the Holy Spirit constantly doing things, God does it through miracles. He can do it through other things in our lives. He can do it through somebody seeing somebody else's life. He can take a message, he can take a word, he can take a song, he can take a Bible track. Yes, you can be saved by even a Bible track. The things of that nature that take it through that, that draw us to know him. But we still have the free will to deny it. And she wants to. Go ahead, Brian. No, she, she, she actually had to. Oh, well, I was going to say. Uh, yeah, go ahead. One difference I see is, uh, between the unbeliever and the believer is uh, and 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 folly and wisdom is that when we uh, walk in the path of the unrighteous, we as believers walk in the path of the unrighteous, then we are wrestling with a pig, and and I like to say when we wrestle with pigs, we both get covered in slop, and the pig likes it. And the pig doesn't know any different. The pig does not, by nature, automatically disobeys God. That is to say, figuratively speaking. We, do, we make foolish choices. Now, see, the wisdom would be, well, you know what? I don't want pig slop on me, so I'm going to step out of that, and I'm not going to ever go back over there because I'm just going to get slop all over me, and the pig enjoys it, and I don't. So I'm going to walk away from that. So I would see that as the basic difference between a, a, a folly decision and a wise decision, okay. if you want to try to tie it back to, to the lesson. Okay. Going back to when you talk about non-believer, I once was a non-believer. I grew up Jewish. I'm still Jewish, and I'm a follower of Christ today. Okay. As a non-believer, how did I get to the place to accept Christ with brokenness? And a lot of times when you have no other place to run, or you think you're living the right life because you don't know differently. And um, people who may have witnessed to you were not effective to you in the way that they chose to witness because they were timid. They weren't really bold then you wind up staying at the same place until one day you have nowhere to turn and you feel desperate. And when you have a sense of desperation, however, I had in my life I had Christian friends. But when I think back, one witness to me, okay, and the others I just don't remember being witness to. Mm -hmm. But I looked at their lives and I thought, well, they're different. Mm -hmm. In the way that they handle the situation, we all have trials, we all have problems, and nobody's perfect. We all have flesh, we all show it sometimes. We're not perfect. But there was something different about them. They had this peace about them. 
and, and they were wisdom filled. And it wasn't about self, it was giving themselves away to others. And that's the Christian life, and it's such a blessing. And it took me to brokenness to accept Christ. And I just feel like a lot of, and there is such a thing as non-believers and believers. Believers accept Christ. If you don't accept Christ, you're a non-believer, unbeliever, call it what you want. And if you know Christ, but one day you're watching your brother or sister and they're kind of backsliding and not living the life they're supposed to be living, not perfect, but something that's really troubling, then it's our responsibility as a Christian to bring our brother or sister back where they need to be. And that's the difference. But I was not saved, and that is a non-believer. That's, that's kind of like what, what you just said. It's kind of like what Frank shared about a year and a half or so ago. Um, that as a, as a Christian, as a brother in the Lord, if he saw me doing something wrong, it's his responsibility to make me aware of that and hold me accountable to, to get back in the Word, follow the Lord, and do what's right. And it's all of our responsibilities to do that. We we need each other to to grow and, and to and to walk in the ways the Lord calls the flesh is weak. Okay, yeah, go ahead. What about the prodigal son? Because he was a believer. He went out into the world on his own, made foolish decisions, but he came to the realization he needed to come back. What about that situation? Don't we all? I mean, even even after accepting Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, there's been times I've turned my back on God. There's been times I've made unwise decisions. There's been times that I've done what John wanted to do instead of what God wanted me to do. You see what I'm saying? But, but the beauty of that story is, first of all, we've got to understand what pushed the prodigal son away. It wasn't lack of food. There was plenty of food on the table. It wasn't, it wasn't lack of love because his father loved him. <clears throat> it may have been the jealousy and envy of the other brother that pushed him away. Who knows? But, but the point of the whole thing is this. When he did realize that he had done wrong and he had wrestled with the pigs and found himself in the pig pen and eating the husks. He said, this is, this is, I'll go back to my father and be his servant. And, and his father saw him coming from a distance and ran and embraced him and killed the calf and put a robe and a ring and you see what I'm saying? And that's the same thing with us. Yo, know, all of us, have made mistakes. All of us have given in to folly in our lives and not answered the call of wisdom. And for some of us, it's, it's had very traumatic consequences. And for others, you know, only by God's grace were we spared those consequences. But I'm going to tell you, and Dr. Stanley says it all the time, there's always going to be consequences, regardless of the decisions that you make. And, and so I look back at Rachel. At, um, in, in 1979, that was my first year of teaching and coaching, one year out of college. I was young. You know where I was teaching and coaching at? Douglas County, Georgia. Okay? I was there for one year, and I could not stand my principal. I didn't like it. <laughs> Okay, now I'm not going to say any names because Chris is recording this, but, <laughs> but going on in instead, oh, right. it's already up. <laughs> instead of praying about what to do about this bitterness that I had between myself and my principal, I decided I'm going to put my resume out there and I'm going to try to get another job somewhere else. Instead of saying, to the human resources department, yo, know, could I get a transfer to another school? Could I get this? Could I get that? So, I'm, I'm, this is a long way to get to this short story, but what I'm saying is I made a decision to accept offensive coordinator position and assistant baseball coach at Tennessee High School in Bristol, Tennessee. Okay? 
I was there for three years, then I got hired at Troy State University in Alabama. So you gotta remember, one year of teaching in Douglas County, Georgia, three years of teaching at Tennessee High School in Bristol, going Tennessee, and then going to Alabama. Now, what have I set the pattern of? I've set the pattern because when you're 23, 24 years old, you don't think about retirement. When you're 59, you do. If I had, see, Alabama, Tennessee, and Georgia don't have reciprocity in their retirement systems. They do in their certification, but not in retirement. So here I am at 59 years old, and I'm one year past what I could have retired at. Mm -hmm. And I could have gotten a job at a golf course or something and, you know, had fun. You know, not that teaching's not fun, but do you understand, you, you understand where I'm going right here? I made an unwise decision based on my personal feelings and not on the leadership of God. You see what I'm saying? And so not having the retirement built up to be able to retire is one of the consequences of that foolishness. Mm -hmm. And even when you're not foolish, uh, it, life doesn't always go the way that you want it to go. I've been laid off so many times, so many years, just as many other people. That they, or when my daughter lost her daddy and you don't figure how you're going to support this child now instead of a two-parent household, it's a one-parent household. And later on being laid off from one job to another because companies made poor business decisions, you know, financial decisions, and there's no 401k. Well, my bank is the bank of Jesus Christ. Because as far as I'm concerned, wherever he'll put me is fine with me. As long as you do your part. And when you err and you make mistakes, and if you don't have enough money saved up because of that, he already knew that, and he's got other purpose for us. So, well, yeah, I, so much for that. I don't, I don't get on Facebook a lot, but I uh, read something that Paul put on there uh, the other day. He walked by the ATM and it flashed insufficient funds yeah. without even putting his card in. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the, thing, the thing that you're saying about the bank of heaven is that we will never go to God and come back with a message of insufficient funds. Amen. You know, he's able to, he will meet all our needs according to his riches and glory. But we have the gigantic responsibility to be obedient to his word, to be faithful to his service. And, and the thing that you were sharing a few minutes ago about some people witnessed to you uh, earlier and it didn't have that big of an impact, but they may have been good, solid Christians in and of themselves, but the thing about it is the Word of God will never come back for them. And so they may have planted a seed that just needed to be that's watered exactly, and harvested. That's exactly right. They put it there and when it came back, it's like something that just went over, going over your head. I had a woman just give me a very dear friend of mine and actually she's one of them between my daughter my daughter got saved on, coming back from college her first semester. She witnessed to me, along with the friends I have here in this church, very good friends. But the point is, one day when I was working with my girlfriend years ago, she used to sometimes put like on a string a piece of chocolate. And she would put all kinds of things on there, you know, we'd go have lunch together. And I knew she was Christian, but I wasn't. And then one day she gave me this little tiny piece of paper, and it was this paper that said, come in the door. I didn't even know what it meant. She didn't explain what it meant. I've had it all these years, so when I accepted Christ in my life, I was able to go back and say, you know, I have this. It's sitting in my, in my uh, journal. And I said, I understand what you're trying to say. So, yes, yeah, some people, it comes back to you, but someone else is still brought in your sight who is very effective sometimes. Very bold. Uh, <laughs> that'll do it. Okay. All right. So, so here's here's the what verses one through six say right here is that the invitation to wisdom, the invitation to wisdom is directed to everyone. Everyone. It doesn't matter, and it includes the request to listen. See, so many times. So many times in our prayer lives, in our quiet times, you know, we want to talk to God. But we don't want to listen to what He has to say. And a lot of times when we make decisions, we make those decisions based on how we feel right now. The, the Christian life is not about, it's not about feeling. It's about the fact. 
that Jesus shed his blood, gave his life on Calvary as the sacrificial lamb, as the unblemished sacrificial lamb. He was dead and buried. The third day he arose. And, you know, before he left, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. That where I go, you may be. Yeah, you know, I'll come again. So, you know, or, you know, I'm thinking ahead and forgetting what I'm saying. But here's the thing. Godly wisdom focuses on faith and obedience. We have faith in God. Then we need to be obedient to his word right here. So, what wisdom did it, it urged the foolish the, to, to be sharp or wise in their decision making in words and in actions and she cited common sense as a valuable asset. Okay, So I don't know how I can be in public education for 31 years and still have common sense but anyway what, what do the locations of wisdom in these six, pass, uh, six verses right here what, what do the locations where wisdom issued her invitation tell believers today? Um, like the city gates would be a whole metropolis, a whole city-wide situation. Um, fork in the road changes in your life and make a decision based on what's going on. And then every household within your own self, your own home, private, private <laughs> corporately and privately. Okay, corporately, privately, wherever people are, what else? See, wisdom delivered her message wherever people could be found. Wherever people could be found. So, whoever needed that invitation had the, had the <coughs> ability to respond to that invitation. Let me ask you a question. Where is it hardest for you to be a Christian? Doing sex. <laughs> okay, okay. Dear and sex. I think you'd be at home. You did. You would probably be at home. Work. Okay. Uh, Car. I work in the kitchen at the shelter. Working in the kitchen at the shelter? It, it's hard to be a, a Christian there. She gets so many comments, so much criticism. Okay, okay. Anybody else? so they will know Christ. However, you can't cross the boundary line of what you can do or cannot do as a Christian. Two of the places that's hardest for me uh, being a baseball coach is when you get an umpire that really can't see very well um. and, and he doesn't make the right call. And I know he doesn't make the right God knows he doesn't make the right call. But, but you know, I go out there and try to witness to him and, and let him know the importance of making the right call because it can have an effect on the outcome of the game. And you have questions about the inheritance or things like that? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then the other, the other is this right here, is, is when you coach out there on that field and you practice for two or three hours a day, about how to turn a double play, how the pitcher covers on a, on a slow roller to first base, how, you know, I mean, all the techniques, how to, you know, what to do on an 0-2 count, what to do, you know, all these things. And then those kids go out there and they do it any old way they want to. <laughs> and then when they come back to the dugout, you know, I again share with them and witness to them and, and you know, hug them and embrace them and tell them what, yeah. Yeah. 
the, yeah, the thing that the thing that my principal told me this past week because I got a little bit heated at, at one of our baseball games, um, and he wasn't chastising me or anything, but um, yeah, he said, you know, these parents are sending us their very best. And I, wow. Yeah, maybe they better go back and try it again. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. Wisdom delivered her message to whoever could be found, whoever would listen, and, and whoever would respond to that. She stood on the hills overlooking the cities, the roads, the gates, the major intersections. Now, as believers today, we need to get outside the walls of the church. We need to get outside the walls of the church. We need to get out of our comfort zone. We need to go to, to the sidewalk ministry. We need to go to the prison ministry. We need to go to the shelters. We need to reach out. And then those of you who reside temporarily in the shelter right now, you need to share the gospel and, and, and make those decisions based on your faith in Jesus Christ. No matter how hard it is, no matter how tough it is, no matter how unpopular it is. Because you are going to be laughed at, you are going to be scorned, you are going to be made fun of. But see, we need to get outside the walls of this church. We need to go to the unsaved. We need to go to, to the workplaces. We need to go to the fitness centers. We need to go to the shopping malls. Because the, the fact of the matter is this right here. And I know every Sunday we pray for our country and we pray for our economy and we pray for you know, God to, to intervene in, in our society right now. But what are we doing? What are we doing here in Atlanta? Are we reaching out? Are we going to the places that's uncomfortable for us? Are we sharing the love of Jesus Christ with other people? The thing about it is, we got to share with the rich and the poor. We got to share with the educated and the uneducated. We got to share with the attractive or the unattractive. Uh, not. No, I didn't mean to. Thank you, John. Uh, I almost forgot your name on the Christmas list. Mommy, not to ever buy you lunch again. But the thing about it is, we've got to be willing. That's, that's the thing. We've got to be willing to go wherever God leads us. Amen. We've got to be willing to go. We've got to be able to love. We've got to be able to, to demonstrate the love of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. to other people. Mm -hmm. Now, you, know, you talk about testimonies in your past. You talk about your great-grandmother's testimony as she was making that transition from this life to eternal life right here. And the, and the thing about it is, we all have different personalities. We all... Uh, have different ways of relating to people. But the message of love comes in one language. And that's it. Don't be afraid to embrace. Don't be in, afraid to reach out. Don't be afraid to get your hands a little bit dirty for the glory of God. You know, whatever that is. And that's what wisdom is telling us right here. No matter who it is, rich, poor, educated, uneducated, whoever it is. Be willing to reach out, show the love of Jesus in this situation. Turn to the ninth chapter of Proverbs and go down to verse 13. The ninth chapter, verse 13. And somebody read for me verses 13 through 17. The woman of folly is boisterous. She is naive and knows nothing. She sits at the doorway of her house, on a seat by the high places of the city, calling to those who pass by, who are making their path straight. Whoever is naive, let him turn in here, and let him who lacks understanding, she says, stolen water is sweet, and bread eaten is and secret is pleasant. Okay, so... In, in 13 through 17, Solomon describes 
folly in three ways right here. Boisterous or rowdy, gullible, and knows nothing. So my question to you is this right here. If these are the characteristics of folly, of foolish decisions we make, if these are the characteristics of foolishness, why would anyone be drawn to such a lifestyle? Because it's the immediate gratification of the feel good, right? It's the norm. Okay. It's the socially acceptable thing to do, right? Because being a Christian and sharing the gospel is not the socially acceptable thing to do. As, as a matter of fact, some of us are going to be ridiculed and chastised for sharing the gospel. Go ahead. Yeah. Dr. Stanley actually made a little notation in the Bible about that specific verse. And it says, there's a certain thrill of doing forbidden things that no one sees you do. An adrenaline rush often accompanies this kind of living on the edge, but it ends when you fall off the cliff. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's pretty solid right there. Yeah, that is, that's good. When it's, when it's a feel good mode and all, it, it's freedom. You feel you're free, but really it's not so normal because you're not free. You're free when you're in Christ. You're free. So it's the opposite. You know, it, but you don't know it because it all feels just so right and with no limitations. You do what you want. Don't have to think about anybody, anything. You know, like today is Sunday. It's raining and everything. It's a horrible day to have to get in your car and drive a lot of miles, come to church. Oh my. And somebody's out there doing something else for themselves instead of serving each other. Yeah, it's easy to do that, but in the end, it's, it's just it's what it says in verse 18. And he knows not that the other day ever gets in the deficit. Can I ask a question? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, um, because you know, I mean, this description you know, of a non-believer, you know, the way you say it, uh -huh. okay, would you be, would you be, would you be refusing to take that message to that person and then let her have, her or him, whatever, make the choice as to whether or not they want to be a non-believer or a believer? Right. Do you see what I'm saying? I, I think I do. That's what I wanted to yeah, let, understand a little bit better. Yeah, let me let, let me respond and see if I do understand okay. what you're saying. All right. I don't think we have the right as Christians to uh, say yes, I will witness to this person, or no, I won't witness to this person, regardless of who they are or where they are. Yeah. I think we have the responsibility, right, right, to to not only verbally articulate you know, the Word of God to people or plan of salvation, but to live the life that exemplifies that commitment. Yeah, but well. that's what the apostles were told to do. And if somebody refuses to listen at, in that town or city, then you dust your feet off and you turn around and you walk away. Right, yeah. right. Okay. See, if, here, here's the danger, and I understand what you're saying, and, and it's, a, it's a very, very tough line to discern right here, is that how long do I witness? How long do I share? How long do I try to influence this person? Because see, sin is like a vortex and it just kind of sucks you in. And no matter how willing the heart is, sometimes the mind doesn't think rationally. You understand what I'm saying? And so I'm going to stay here and I'm going to keep trying to witness, keep trying to bring them in. All of a sudden we get sucked into their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You understand? Because we're all human. Yeah. And we rely on our faith in God. We rely on those things to keep us strong and to keep us faithful mm -hmm. and to keep us obedient. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Did I answer your question? Um. Yeah, sort of, kind of. I, I just don't, uh, I want to I wanna know that um, 
that because of how how, how I feel now mm -hmm. that I want I want to go grow even closer to Christ. Uh -huh. Okay, I don't I don't want other you know the other lost sheep. Okay, to think that they're not ever forgiven. Uh -huh. Because God because Christ you know speaks that no matter what your sins you're not never forgiven. Right. Right. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. And you do that just by living your life. You do yeah. that by them seeing you read the word right. or whenever you have the opportunity to share with them you can. But again, you know, the greatest witness and the greatest testimony, the most powerful thing we have as Christians is the love of Jesus. And right. if you can love them with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. uh, but I think it's important for all of us to realize that some people, especially who have suffered some pretty tough consequences, to understand that whatever we do, no matter what we well, do, who we do, when right. we do, that we are forgiven. Yeah. And not only when you get forgiven are you forgiven, and then God doesn't bring it up a few years later. Satan does, but God does. Yeah. You know, he yeah. throws it into the lake of forgiveness. Yeah. So, yes, that forgiveness is something that you can, yeah. Well, I would like to say that um, the Holy Spirit, if we get out of the way and realize that the Holy Spirit is doing the work, he comes to convict, he comes to correct. See, this is his job. We are the planner. We may even be the war, but only God can give the increase. Yeah. So when we feel condemned, it might, the conviction comes from the Holy Spirit and not out of ourselves. So he deal with the conscience to the unbeliever. But with us, we have the spirit. We can quench him. We can even uh, grieve him. We can do that. And that's premium to a death of, among the believers because of this. But it's all about God's spirit, who he convict and who he corrects. It's not us. And when I'm out on that street, when I um, witnesses of someone and they may not even accept Christ as their personal savior at that time. It doesn't mean that they not you may not be saved later. I know I'm just out there as a vessel being used of God and that that's not my responsibility. And it also does not mean that you didn't do your job. Right. Yeah, exactly. It does. You did your job. Right. And if they reject Christ, you know if they reject Christ, that's on them. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, go ahead. Also, you have to realize there's also the spiritual, the spirit also gives us discernment at times. Right. So there may be times that you will help that person out, and then sometimes the spirit will say, I don't think you want to get involved with that. Yeah. And that's where Jesus gives the balance of help your fellow, fellow man, but also don't cast your pearls before swine. So there's that fine line where if you have the spirit deciding or guiding for you, you can go, okay, I'll go this way, or you want to help, but then you go, mm, maybe not on this. Point. Yeah, good point. And uh, sometimes the people who are trying to bear fruit, they're not right there. Except they branches is not all together. They got some cracks in them too. So, and then therefore, they're not going to be able to bear more fruit because God said that if you bear fruit, you will bear more fruit. But if you don't, you know, even even if it's just you apologizing to a brother and sister, he said, before you come, you know, go try to do something else, you need to go apologize to your brother and sister first. So sometimes when these people trying to be missionaries, they don't realize that they're the ones who need to uh, fix their branches before they try to go make fruit because they're not going to go to that person unless God sent them to them anyway. So just by them going to that person is telling them, yes, God sent me to the person, but what about me? I need to be correct before, you know, so maybe they need to fix their branches before they kind of put some food on there themselves. That's a very good point. Yeah. And I think we fall into a trap sometimes of trying to make our own fruit. We don't need to do that. We need to allow the fruit to come forth by, by obedience to the Word of God and let God bring that fruit forward. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> What I was thinking about when, you, when I go in the street and I witness, what I'm actually doing is planting seeds. It's not all the time that you're going to see the fruit it's right up. This person going to say, y'all want to come to the Lord right now and I want to be saved. You rarely hear that. But what you do is you plant the seed in the thought of this person's mind that they can become a Christian, they can't be saved, as opposed to that they're going to hell. You know, they have that in their mind. So you plant that seed and then later on, Somebody else may tell them something else. Somebody else may tell them something else. And as, you, as God, as the Holy Spirit waters it, 
then they understand. And then they can survive. Then they understand what it is to become a Christian. So right. You just keep planting seed. <coughs> just keep planting seed, yeah. I had a situation last week where I was on the way home from uh, work and there was a there was a lady there trying to give me a Jehovah's Witness watchtower. I said, Okay, I'll take this if you'll take something that I gave her. I gave her a track from my home church. Uh-huh. And she's where like, is home? Okay. My home is uh, in Hiram. It's Welcome Hill Baptist Church. Okay. Um, it used to be in Douglasville. Okay. <laughs> now it's in Hiram. And we, I gave her one of our tracks, and it, it kind of felt good to see her actually sit there and read it, but she didn't come ask me any questions or anything, which I didn't expect her to. But the seed is planted there now. So it's up to I planted it. It's up to her to get it watered and to grow. Yeah, that's good. Do what? In other words, she reached out to her. Yes. Yeah. God makes it grow. Yeah, God. We're not spies, you know. Our job is not to spy and check it on you and see if you can read that. Right. You know what I mean? So Yes, he does know what we. He also knows our very vulnerable areas, our areas of weakness. Yes, so. Yes, yes. So, so the point is. Folly, unlike wisdom or foolishness right here, is portrayed as being rowdy, unruly, easily led in the wrong directions. Uh, she appeals, first of all, to, to the inexperienced. And then she tempts people into immoral behavior, whether that's sexual, whether that's criminal, whatever it is. And, and it may not be sexual or criminal. It may just be something that's not in a line with God's will, his plan for our lives right there. So the, the problem is that folly tries to ensnare people. And, and while wisdom, wisdom on the other hand, points them to a saving relationship with Christ. Okay? Now, I will tell you this. When I was diagnosed uh, last summer with cancer, you know, and, and we we went through all the options and everything. I I, w- I went to my family practitioner, and then he sent me to a urologist, and and so you know he confirmed it, and did a biopsy, and all this other stuff. Well, I was just going to stick with that one doctor right there. Well, some of you remember uh, when Paul was presenting the Bama. Well, that was about a week before my scheduled surgery. And what they were going to do was going to do the uh, five incisions, uh, laparoscopic or whatever you call it. I don't know what you call it. Yeah, that's right. Uh, 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 robotic surgery, yeah. It's also uh, laparoscopic. And so I got up and left the uh, uh, presentation of the baby to go down there. And I wanted to go up and talk to Dr. Stanley and just have him pray for me for my upcoming surgery. And so when I went and told him the type of cancer I had and, and everything, he said, I want you to call me tomorrow at In Touch. And he took his pen out, wrote his number down, gave it to me. And I thought, well, I'm going to call In Touch and get 15 different secretaries and, and everything. But I called the number and he said, hello. <laughs> it was his cell number. You know, I'm not giving it out to anybody. But, uh, uh, got it on tape. We got that on tape. He said, and, and, and I told him, I told him, he said, I think it would be a wise choice to get a second opinion. And he said, I've got a friend that I want to recommend you to over here, Northside. So um, I said, well, Shoot, you know, if Dr. Stanley says it's wise, let's be wise, you know. So, uh, you know, it took off, it, it, it delayed my surgery for a couple of more weeks, but um, I had one of the best surgeons, in my opinion, in Metro Atlanta, and he took good care of me. He 
you know, cut me open. He didn't do the robotic thing and, and everything. And, you know, he said the problem with robotic, he said, I'm sitting here at a uh, screen and you may be over here somewhere. I don't act, I don't ever see you. I just, you know, got it. I said, you mean kind of like playing a video game? Yeah, you know, and, yeah. and that's probably, that's a little bit yeah, what it's, it's perfect like. Description. And Dr. Kasabian said, you know, I like to be able to look, to see, to feel. You know, I like to be able to see what I'm operating on with so many sensitive nerves around that area. And uh, so, you know, everything turned out great. Even though I was a believer, even though I trusted God in everything, even though we as chosen people came up and laid hands on me, you know, the wisest choice was to go to Dr. Kasabian because the uh, there's a class action lawsuit now against some of the doctors, and mine was one that's included that performs the robotic surgery because of some kind of uh, problem they're having. I don't know, but uh, but here's the thing: wisdom always points us in the right direction, no matter what it is. Okay. So the only resemblance between <clears throat> wisdom and folly is the places they go to invite people. See, you know, we go out to the sidewalk ministry, to the abortion clinics, um, to the prisons and all these other places, but folly is there too. Making unwise choices that's going to have lasting impacts on our lives. And we don't try to hammer the Word of God at them because sometimes that's not the most, uh, that's not the best way to do it. What we got to do is love them and present them with the Gospel. And, and so, both wisdom and folly can be found where people gather. And that we need to understand, what we need to understand this morning is that even as we follow wisdom and do service for Jesus, even as we do this, even as we do that, folly will constantly be there trying to ensnare us into the world's ways. You know, if you're not being tempted by Satan, then you're probably not serving the Lord not like you should. You better ask somebody. Do what? I said you better ask somebody. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so let me let me ask you a question here. In in Proverbs nine, right here, uh, thirteen through seventeen, what is what is this passage saying? Um, what in this gospel message right here could appeal to unbelievers trapped in sinful living? Reread that. Let, I'll read for you. A foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knows nothing. For she sits at the door of her house on a seat by the highest places of the city to call to those who pass by, who go straight on their way. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. And as for him who lacks understanding, she says to him, Stolen water is sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. So, what does that passage right there say to unbelievers that might appeal them who are trapped in sinful lives? Yeah. That misery love company. Ooh, yeah. That, that, that's better than the answer I wrote down here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do what? I said that really is a good answer if you really don't have to look too deep in that because that's what it's going to bring you. It, on the surface, everything looks nice and, you know, sweet and it's going to be fun. It's, it's going to be exhilarating. It's going to be wonderful. But once everything settles in and the sin has been committed, of course, the Bible talks about how death began to um, generate itself and the curse can open the door for that and hardships. And there's no telling with this woman or it's an analogy that everything looks good on the surface when it's contrary to what God tried to lead you from, which is the cemetery. Uh -huh. But it will bring death. It will 
you know, and out of that, mm -hmm. and all those pleasures that you had in such a short period of time become very sour. Yeah. And it would be regret, uh, regretful, I believe, as well. Like Pastor Stanley talks about, that his favorite quote is, you reap what you sow more than you sow, but later. Sometimes it's not something that's going to be instantaneous. Sometimes um, the results of sin might come years later uh, based on foolishness versus wisdom. You know, sometimes we dab into different things, sexual or smoking or things that can be destructive to the temple, relationships, etc. Sometimes that doesn't occur until the next generation, maybe even your seed or your children. And you see things that, you know, like David had experienced, that's just one example, where his children, you know, reap certain things that he, because of what he had committed, because of disobedience. So, like she was saying, you know, it, it's going to bring misery um, somewhere down the line. You know, it's best to repent, you know, if you're a believer, at times to repent that's, as soon as... That's not what I was saying, to bring misery. Oh, I'm, I'm saying, like, you got a lady that's sitting on the porch, uh -huh. and, and that's all she wants is unexperienced people around her, people that's that's like from the hood or something. She don't want to see no educated woman walking past or no person that got sense or something to come in her house. She only wants the people from the hood. She's calling yeah. out and she like, you know, she only wants the people that's miserable already that don't know how to get out of the situation. Uh -huh. It's sometimes <clears throat> like you, like uh, my sister used to say, she keep an ugly girl with her so they'll know that she's pretty. <laughs> no, that's what my sister used to say all the time. My older sister say that. But, it's a right, right, because yeah. you got people who, who only wants to go by that. They only want people around them that's used to doing that's true what too. they're and doing. That's a miserable existence. Yeah, that's true. Right, well, that's why I say misery love company. See, she ain't going to want nobody coming by that's got more than her or nothing. She wants those people that, like... On her level. Right, on her so level. She's and, right, time. she's comfortable because she don't want you to make her look bad. You know, because if you come around and you all you look at you, you looking yeah. good and stuff, then she ain't looking good. She looking like the ignorant person. So it's trying to make stupid look good. When stupid ain't good. Well, ignorant I'm going to start good. hanging around ugly people. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just reflecting. He said, train up a child in the way he should go. Mm -hmm. And when he's old, he will not depart from the You know, just thinking back. And that goes the other way around, too. Because if you get ungodly trained, right. you know, it's very hard to come out of ungodly training. So it was talking about the undisciplined person. So, you know, in terms of not being trained in a proper way, and, you know, clamor to me is talking a lot. You know, it's, you know, talking about nothing pretty much. Mm -hmm. so, I, think, I think when you think about this, yeah. when you think about, uh, Every time you've answered folly instead of wisdom, yeah. you've done it with somebody else. So what you're saying as far as misery loves company is exactly true right there. And, and the same point right here is that very few people make unwise decisions yeah. on their own or by themselves. Okay? And so the thing, the thing that I want to bring out of verses 13 through 17 here is that People struggling, people struggling with guilt, they often desire a change in their lives. They want to change, but they realize how powerless they are. How powerless they are. They realize they can't do it themselves. And a lot of times, people who are trapped in sinful lifestyles try to change without Jesus and they fall back on their face again. Mm -hmm. And so, so the thing about it is, is that wisdom's message of love and forgiveness is something that we've all longed for. Mm -hmm. And I think we can all go back to a point in our lives right here where we made a decision to accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and God always sent someone to encourage us, to undergird us, to give us strength when we needed it. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. 
Can I read something that I found at our shelter this morning? Is, sure. is that okay with you? Sure. This, is, this goes by what you were just speaking of. Okay. Because it's like the perfect description for people who feel that way. The disappointments are, of life are in reality one of eternal purposes by which our lives are foreordained. I have a message for you today. I will whisper it softly in your ear in order that the storm clouds which appear may be gilded by glory and that the thorns on which you may have to walk might be blunted. The message is short, a tiny sentence, but allow it to sink into the depths of your heart and be a pillow on which you may rest your weary head. This thing is from me. Have you ever thought that all which concerns you concerns me also? He that touches thee touches the apple of my eye, Zachary 2.8. You have been precious in my eyes. That is why I take a special interest in your upbringing. When temptation assails you and the enemy shall come in like a flood, it is my desire for you to know that this thing is from me. I am the God of circumstances. You have not been placed where you are by chance, but because it is the place I have chosen for you. Did you not ask to become humble? Behold, I place you in the very spot where this lesson is to be learned. It is by your surroundings and your companions that the working of my will is to come about. Do you have money difficulties? It is hard to keep within your income. This thing is from me. I am he that possesses all things. I wish for you to draw everything from me and, de and depend entirely on me. My riches are limitless. Put my promises, and it goes on and, you know, but it's just that what you had brought up reminded me of that. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing that. Okay. Yeah. That was beautiful. Very nice. It wasn't it? Yes. I think um, I think the thing that that is important here is that a lot of times in this life we pursue things that we may think is God's will. Mm -hmm. But it ends up in the end being empty and shallow and unfulfilled. Okay, um, in the coaching fraternity, I was a head football coach before I was a head baseball coach. Okay, and I told you about 1979, my first year. Well, when I first entered teaching and coaching, my goal was to coach on the college level, particularly at the University of Alabama. Okay, and so, you know, that's what I was wanting to work for, and that's, you know, that was what was the main thing in my life from day one to, to, to the point of accepting Jesus as my Savior. Well, it's, it's amazing how things work out because I'm sitting at home in Bristol, Tennessee and the phone rings and it's a buddy of mine from the University of Alabama and he said, John, do you still want to get in college coaching? I said, absolutely, and I was thinking, Alabama, Bear Bryant, you know, the whole mm, thing, mm. you know, and I was thinking, yes, yes, I do, and he said, well, Chan Gailey's just got hired at Troy State University, he's trying to fill his staff with a Christian staff, and I think you could do good, you know, calling and setting up an interview, so I went down there, two years later, we won the national championship. And at the, at the celebration ceremony, the banquet and everything, we got our national championship rings and that thing's so big, you know, and it's so nice and, and everything. And that ring is how I define myself. And it was shallow and it was empty and it was unfulfilled. So a lot of times we think that we're doing the right thing because God wants us to be successful but success is not measured by your status, by the number of national championships, by your income, or anything like that. And we need to understand that if we answer folly, if we follow foolishness in this life, it will always come up empty and shallow and unfulfilling. But if we follow wisdom, we'll always be filled with the satisfaction of knowing that we're obedient and we're faithful to God's call in our lives, regardless of what that is. Okay? Now, let's go back to chapter 8 and go down to the 17th verse. Chapter 8. 
verse 17. Somebody read uh, verses 17 through 21. I love those who love me, and those who see me find me. When we are riches and honor, enjoying wealth and prosperity, my food is better than fine gold, or I use the past to trust silver. I walk in the way of righteousness, along the path of justice. Okay. I love those who love me. So wisdom's message to unbelievers here is that wisdom is inviting us into a love relationship. Wisdom is inviting us into a love relationship. And so wisdom's message requires a choice to follow Christ. A choice. That's your choice. It's just like um, Rachel said at the very beginning of class here, is that we all have free will. We can make that choice to accept Jesus Christ or reject Him. Either way, there's a choice and you're at the crossroads where wisdom and folly are both calling out. And we can choose either to accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior or walk in the ways of the world. And by choosing that, we are to live a godly life. Now, God's message is for everyone who seeks Him and desires to make a change and choose a relationship with Jesus Christ in this life so it can have eternal consequences that's going to be embraced. Okay? Uh, now, let's, let's clarify something here in, in uh, verses 17 through 21 here. And this is very important. And if you, if you don't get anything else out of this lesson, then I've done a very poor job of teaching. But here's, here's, here's my question. Does choosing wisdom guarantee material prosperity. No. No. Some people define prosperity differently, so define it for me. Well some people might assume that prosperity is when you don't invest maybe in let's say for example in your family as much as you should. Um, male or female who put more emphasis on trying to climb the corporate ladder versus um, one is needing to invest their time in their spouse or their children, etc. But they have reached a certain um, financial level, let's say for example, but their children are suffering from um, lack of um, fatherly guidance or being there with them when they need them to be there for you know, their uh, sports activities, or just spending time with them. Some, because the world tends to focus so much on um, financial wealth and material things, and um, who have the latest iPhone and Samsung and Androids and de <coughs> devices and, you know, luxury vehicles and houses, rather than, you know, investing in, like, their health, uh, physical health and family, which is very important to God. Those are the most, most important things. Right. That's a successful man, a successful woman. In God's eyes, you know, becoming, you know, a CEO or the vice president or a manager or director. Or yeah. All right, choosing, choosing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's famous. Right. All right, choosing to. Well, no follow wisdom does not, and I think we all agree with that, guarantee financial success. This is not a prosperity message right here. This is not a prosperity gospel right here. You know, wise living leads people away from selfishness and greed and dishonesty of getting whatever they can, no matter who they hurt, no matter who they step on. And the thing about it is, is that now you can accept Jesus Christ and God may bless you with great wealth and then he may not 
but he knows exactly where you are and what you need, and he will provide you, he'll supply your needs according to his riches and glory, whatever that is. So it has nothing to do with financial wealth or struggles. What we've got to understand and remember here is that wisdom calls us into a love relationship which requires service for God and to be obedient to His will. So, in today's world of, of noise and competing voices and temptations and all this, recognizing godly wisdom is the way to have a blessed life. And, and this comes only through that personal relationship that I'm talking about with Jesus Christ. Folly leads to death. And we all must choose to bear the consequences of the choices we make. So today, you know, I ask you, do you choose to follow the path of wisdom? Or do you choose to follow the path of foolishness? And so my prayer is that each one of us regardless of what we do, where we are, what our circumstances may be, that we will follow that path of wisdom and receive blessings from God that aren't limited to financial success. Or yeah, this calls to mind the whole, uh, your lesson calls to mind Galatians um, 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I live but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Right, right. So we, we follow after Christ, and that's what it's about. If you follow after a position, a status symbol, or whatever, it's going to lead to failure, it's going to lead to temporary success, and it's going to lead to emptiness. Okay. Now, as we go through the week, I want you to continue to pray for Chris and the loss of his father. Uh, I want you to pray for Frank and lost his brother-in-law. I want you to pray for Paul's brother, Terry, down in Florida as he uh, comes off the uh, chemotherapy and things. I want you to pray for Judy. Does anybody else have any special prayer requests as we go to the Lord? I keep my mother in prayer. She's Pastor Paul's brother. Pastor Paul's brother. Pastor Paul's brother. I have a rather tough meeting tomorrow morning uh, from 8.30 to 9, I think, with a supervisor, new supervisor. And the script, the uh, sermon today was really right on for that. But just so that I'm, I'm letting the Lord totally lead me and everything in what I say. Thank you. Very good. That's very good. Anybody else? I have two sisters in Christ that um, are kind of you know, getting off the path, I'll just say that a little bit. You know, like, right them. A lost sheep. They're starting to, yeah. That's life. a lost sheep. There you go. Lost sheep. go a non-believer is someone who chooses not to. A lost sheep well, is you bringing the word to them. <laughs> oh, they're very much in I hate that non-believer thing. <laughs> yeah, I just found out that I have an abnormal liver and I have thyroid. You have what? I am normal liver uh -huh. and I have thyroids. Uh, Elaine, her daughter and grandson. Mary, I have a tough meeting in the morning too at 8.30. Really? Yours is that. Yeah, I've got 35 kids coming into my classroom. And, uh, Perry Diamond. Perry Diamond. Perry Perry Diamond. Anybody like to lead us in prayer? Father God, you are sovereign and in control of everything and everything every situation, every circumstance that uh, lies before us. We just trust in you, Lord God. We um, ask that the words that uh, was uh, 
read on this morning out of your Holy Scripture would just saturate our hearts and minds throughout this week and that it would come to remembrance when we get into certain situations and uh, circumstances that uh, cause us to make decisions on which way we want to go, uh, rather follow after you or the world's way. Uh, we just ask that you would just bless every name that was called before you or placed before you on this morning, uh, that people going through sicknesses, uh, going through um, uh, meetings uh, that's coming up through this week, um, handling um, children as far as uh, being teachers. Uh, we just lay it all before you, Father God. We cast all, for you said in your word, cast all your cares upon you for you care for us. And we just thank you, Lord God, in advance for all of what you're going to do for us throughout this week. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.